だろうな Greetings to everyone present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jinnah Society of International Law. It brings me immense pleasure to invite someone who's invested their entire careers and life towards the protection and the dissemination of the United Nations, its goals and its ambitions. But before I introduce our speaker, I would like to share a few words about the Center for the Study of United Nations. The center aims to develop a learning platform on opportunities and limits of the United Nations by enhancing research and building knowledge on how the United Nations systems work, both in terms of institutional development and in terms of promotion and implementation of various multilateral policies. In my discussions with Professor Popowski over the years, he's often reminded me of the conversation which took place in 1953, when the first Secretary General Trigov Lee welcomed his successor, Doug Hamshkold, the second Secretary General in New York. And he said, and I quote him, welcome Doug to the most impossible job on this earth, end quote. The United Nations has often been criticized and turned into a scapegoat when states have failed to live up to its initial expectations and values of the founders. But let's not forget what Hamshkul famously said as perhaps a response. I quote Hamshkul, the United Nations was not created to take us to heaven, but to save us from hell, end quote. The Center for UN Studies engages in projects immersed in studying the history and traditions of the United Nations, but also takes a transformative approach to research, teaching and societal engagement, having in mind the latest dynamic geopolitical and technological shifts. The Jinnah Society of International Law was founded on the 18th day of November in 2020 and is an initiative which seeks to provide a platform to young international law enthusiasts. The inaugural address and official launch of the society was conducted by the faculty director, Professor Dr. Weston Popowski, our respected vice chancellor, and the chief guest of the event, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, and a very dear friend of the center and society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. Our four lecture series endeavors to study and build upon the introduction given to the given in Future of Internationalism and International Law in the spring lecture series. To assist in this study, the speakers will cover and address their respective areas of expertise based upon the years of research and practice. Given the vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it, the society aims to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in this ecosystem. The lowest common denominator in the fall lecture series is to study and enhance, provide a deeper understanding of international law through international lawyers. The Society for its members is a well of knowledge and a quorum of thought-provoking discussions, which will be the resultant of its engagement with speakers aimed at exploring this ecosystem of international law. Today amongst us, we have Professor Hans Van Loon, who has dedicated his career to private international law, and he will acted as an executive secretary to the Netherlands Standing Government Committee for Codification of Private International Law from 17, 1978 to 1996. He also acted as deputy judge in the Hague District Court from 1984 to 1996. He was the secretary general of the Hague Conference from 30. June 1996 to 30 June 2013. He has also played an instrumental role in creating conventions, something which is extremely unique and we look forward to hearing him on the topic, which for today he has chosen to speak on the private side of transformation, transforming the world 
the role of private international law in achieving sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. Professor Hans Van Loon, it's an honor to have you amongst us. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Marotra. Um, I'm um, delighted to address you from far away The Hague in the Netherlands. And I'm honored and, and very pleased uh, to have been invited by Jindal University um, for this occasion. Um, in this um, lecture series of exploring the ecosystems of international law. Now, at first sight, the theme of our lecture today seems to stand apart from the other lectures in this series, which tend to deal with public international law. Indeed, international law is often, I would even say usually, identified with public international law. But the two disciplines, public and private international law, need and complement each other, and ever more so. It's always been recognized by the Institut de droit international, the International Law Institute, founded in 1873, which, for example, in August of this year, at its biannual meeting, adopted a very interesting resolution on the interaction between uh, private international law on the one hand and human rights on, on, on the other. Um, and also, of course, the Hague Academy of International Law uh, has, for almost a century now, organized summer courses in both disciplines, uh, public and private international. By the way, um, um, if you haven't yet had the opportunity of attending one of the summer, summer courses, I would strongly, strongly recommend you to do that. It's an unbelievable experience, unforgettable experience. All the students that I've spoken uh, are, are very enthusiastic, uh, not only about the lectures, but also about the possibility of connecting with others. Okay, um, now today, if the machine works, today, um, I would like, like to discuss uh, a number of points in relation to the uh, sustainable development agenda of the United Nations. First, a few words about the crisis our world is facing at the moment. It's an economic crisis, it's a social crisis, but it's also very much an environmental and climate change crisis. Now, as a response to all these crises, the United Nations adopted in 2015 the Agenda 2030. So we have another nine years to go. On, with its sustainable development goals. And as we shall see, the sustainable development goals are all inclusive, both regarding their objectives. Um, and a strong statement is made that no one should be left behind. And it is a, uh, they addressed uh, not only to states and international organizations, but also to businesses, to the private sector, to civil society, to you and to me. Um, we need to discuss the role of private action and what it contributes or does not contribute to sustainability. And that brings us to the interplay of the sustainable development goals and private law, private international law. Some of you may not be familiar with what private international law is, so we should discuss that briefly and discuss its role in a globalizing society. And I will give concrete examples at, uh, at the end. Um, all this was uh, studied at a conference, a two, three days conference in September in Hamburg at the Max Planck Institute, which some of you may, may know. Uh, it's a very famous uh, um, institute uh, studying comparative and private international law. And a book has just come out with the conference papers. I'll talk more about that. Then to make things more concrete, I would like to discuss with you three case studies, one on SDG 1, which is on poverty, one on SDG 8, on decent work for everyone, and then uh, SDG 6, 13, and 15, which deal with clean water and sanitation, climate, and the environment. And then we will uh, draw up all this, come up with a uh, conclusion. Now, um, yes, there is. Uh, there are many crises, uh, 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 there's this triple crisis in our world, economic, social, and environmental, and, and, and relating to the climate. Now, as you know, the day after tomorrow, this coming Sunday, the climate change conference will start in Glasgow in Scotland. 
many heads of states will be there, the Secretary General of the UN will be there. And in preparation of that meeting, uh, Secretary General Guterres has sent a stern warning to the world, we must do more to protect our planet from catastrophe, from floods, from storms, from fires and other ecological disasters. We've seen plenty of that in the past few months. In April, May next year, another conference, global conference will take place in Kunming, China on biological diversity. Climate change, loss of biodiversity and pollution affect the whole of humanity and Mother Earth. But large parts of the world population, in addition, suffer from hunger and poverty, social oppression and discrimination. Hence, a triple crisis, economic, social and environmental slash climate. Now, the economic and social parts of the crisis, poverty combined with ills like maltreatment of women and children and others, those uh, ills have been known for quite a long time. And the traditional response has been to enhance economic development. And that has indeed yielded some success over the last half century. Extreme poverty has declined worldwide, although as a result of the pandemic, it is now growing again. But as the Glasgow and Kunming conferences illustrate, the planet as a whole is now facing a crisis of climate change, nature loss and pollution. Temperatures are rising at an unprecedented speed. Biodiversity is quickly declining with uncertain consequences for all of us. Pollution has emerged as a global threat, already killing millions of people each year, getting worse. Many suggest that the Earth has entered a new stage in its development, the Anthropocene, because it's now man, it's us in control and no longer nature. So we are facing a very difficult dilemma. On the one hand, we want to spur economic development to reduce poverty and uh, promote equality of sexes and so on. On the other hand, we know that economic development with its usage of carbon fuels and land resources has had and still is having devastating effects on the planet. We must therefore achieve development in the developing world that is sustainable, and we must everywhere on the planet achieve economic development that avoids negative impacts. So in response to these crises, the United Nations in uh, on, on uh, United Nations General Assembly on the 25th of um, September 2015, six years ago already, unanimously adopted the resolution transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The core of the resolution consists of 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, with 169 associated targets and many more indicators. The um, resolution incorporates a solemn declaration of all the heads of states and government of the world, um, confirming the sustainable development goals. And um, I consider it of the greatest importance that we, all of us become more aware of this agenda and the declaration, because that is the way to hold our heads of states accountable for what they so solemnly declared six years ago. Uh, if we don't, uh, they can just uh, hold their sh shoulders and say, oh yes, that was my predecessor and that doesn't uh, concern me. No, we must keep them, the heads of states, to their word. So who, which are these 17 SDGs? Um, the first is no poverty. The second is no hunger. The third, good health. Fourth, quality education. Fifth, gender equality. That, by the way, uh, in my view, also includes gender orientation equality. 
clean water and sanitation, affordable energy, decent work, industry innovation infrastructure must be um, improved, inequality must be reduced, not just within countries, but also across countries, north and south of the world. Our cities must be, become sustainable. We must develop responsible consumption and production, and especially responsible consumption is a, is a difficult one. It's very difficult to persuade people uh, that they have to uh, consume in a more responsible way. Climate action, of course, life below water, life on land. And then there are two, the last two goals, peace, justice, and strong institutions and partnerships for the goals. Um, they are sort of transversal. They relate to all of the other SDGs uh, because uh, in order to uh, eliminate poverty, for instance, you need a peaceful society, you need justice, you need strong introduction institutions and so on and so forth. And uh, we cannot do it by ourselves. We need to work with everyone um, who is um, uh, available there to, uh, who's willing uh, to, uh, to, to work with us on these, uh, on these goals, these important uh, goals. Um, there is no hierarchy in this list. And that is something that one can uh, regret. Um, and, but it is inherent in our present world situation. We haven't agreed on, on hierarchy, so the SDGs could not do better. We will also see that our interrelations, obvious interrelations between the various uh, SDGs. So how are they structured? I've taken one example. Look again at uh, 13 on climate action. The full title is uh, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And then there are targets and indicators. So you have three levels. You have the level of the SDG, then you have the level of targets, and within each target you have indicators. And we'll talk more <coughs> about that in a moment. But this is just an, an example. So uh, SDG 13 has five targets. Uh, 13, one, strengthen resilience and adaptive capacity to climate hazards. 13, two, integrate climate change measures into national policies and strategies. 13, three, improve awareness, education, capacity. Chair, let me chair the opening of this climate law and public policy conference here in the University of Cambridge in collaboration. Strategies and planning. Um, and then there are two more, uh, more operative um, targets. 13a, implement the commitment undertaken by developed countries to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change of mobilizing jointly 100 billion annually by 2020 from all sources to address the needs of developing countries. I'm not quite sure that has already been, <laughs> been realized. And 13b, promote mechanisms for raising capacity for effective climate change related planning and management in least development countries and small islands, developing states, you, you know that they are particularly exposed to the risks of climate, um, cl climate uh, change, including focusing on women, children and local and marginalized communities. So this gives you an, an idea of the structure of the SDGs, each of the 17 SDGs has a structure like, like that, some with more, some with less targets and uh, the indicators. The indicators, by the way, are uh, scrutinized continuously and are adapted on an annual basis and more thoroughly every five years. And they enable to measure any progress uh, that is uh, made with regard to each of the 70, 17 SDGs. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the SDGs are all inclusive, both regard, regarding their objectives and regarding their addressees. Um, in the preamble, the heads of states say all countries, all stakeholders acting collaboratively will support this plan. We are determined they say, they said in 2015, we are determined to take the bold and transformative steps 
which are urgently needed to shift the world on to a sustainable and resilient path. And we pledge that no one will be left behind. These are strong words. And then they are not addressed only to the states themselves and international organizations, but also to businesses, to the private sector, to universities, to all of us. We the peoples, they said in paragraph 52, are the celebrated opening words of the Charter of the United Nations. It's we the peoples who are embarking today on the road to 2030. Our journey will involve governments as well as parliaments, the United Nations system, other international institutions, local authorities, indigenous peoples, civil society, business and the private sector, the scientific and academic community, all people. All inclusive. Now, the um, SDGs are not legally binding. For the connoisseurs, this is soft law, if law at all. They articulate aspirations and they set out procedures to achieve them with benchmarks, quantitative benchmarks to assess progression towards uh, accomplishments. So this is um, an indicator-driven, target-setting governance with a strong uh, quantitative uh, aspect. And it differs therefore clearly from traditional lawmaking, uh, which is aimed at regulating human behavior by defining the rights and obligations through norms that are usually uh, left in place until they are replaced by new ones. A different strategy, but obviously much of the work that must be done requires also qualitative changes, not least in human behavior. Think of human uh, production and, and, consumer, uh, and consumption. So uh, it's not an alternative, but uh, we, uh, it needs to be combined with norm promotion and rulemaking. They remain crucially needed as complementary or implementing, if you wish, strategies to achieve these sustainable development goals. However, private and private international law, if you read the text, uh, remain below the uh, radar. And that is strange because most transactions, most investments, most destruction of the environment happen not through public, but through private action. And private action is governed partly by public law, but often and predominantly by private law, private international law, commercial law. So private law, private international law has an important role in the quest of, for sustainability. Before we explore that a little further, uh, let me just, for those of you who don't have a precise or, or uh, even rough idea of private international law, um, say a few words about that. Private international law then is the discipline that addresses problems arising from private, interac private uh, 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 interactions, uh, that relations, but also transactions that are connected to more than one legal system. Um, and um, the, 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 the problem is that our world, if you look at it from a legal point of view, is a sort of patchwork of different legal orders and legal systems um, and um, they are in constant flux, and they, but nevertheless, they govern our transactions, even if we cross borders. Most of these systems have not been thought of in terms of what happens when people or businesses cross borders, and that is the problem. It's a patchwork that needs interconnection. Private international law has the role to do that. There are three main areas of private international law. The first main area relates to the uh, jurisdiction of the courts and authorities. If you want to uh, sue someone in another country, uh, do you go to your own court or do you go to the court of the future defendant? If um, you have chosen 
to which court to go. The next question is what law will apply? That now often courts will tend to apply their own law, of course, but not always and not necessarily. For instance, if you have a contract in which the law of another country has been chosen, then in principle, that law will apply. Okay, now you've got your judgment. Will that judgment be enforced in other countries? For instance, in the country where the defendant has assets, it's important that you can enforce the court order in that other country. So these are the three main areas of private international law, jurisdiction of the courts, choice of law, enforcement of judgments. Now you can take the concept a little wider, uh, the concept of private international law, and it also includes uniform substantive private, private law, which is not addressed at cross-border issues, but simply um, at uh, national issues. But it remains very practical that all the different laws of the world um, in certain areas are the same. Think of a sales contract. It's very handy, practical to know that the rights and the obligations of the seller and of the buyer are identical in different legal systems. And uh, that is um, what the Convention on the International Sale of Goods does, uh, been being ratified by many, many countries, including uh, the United States, for instance, but not ratified by India. So that is the more expansive notion of private international law. But we leave that aside now for our talk. Let me give you a few examples then of uh, the interplay of the sustainable development goals and the private international law. You don't need to look far because it, they, they, uh, they, the SDGs demonstrate that interplay uh, very, um, very clearly. For example, the SDGs, uh, SDG 16.9 says that by 2030, all legal systems should provide a legal identity for all, including birth registration. Now, you know very well, of course, that uh, if you are a refugee and you uh, have to you seek refuge in another country, the first question will be, can you show that you have been uh, that you have a birth certificate, or can you show that you have a mar marriage, uh, that you are married, and so on? These are difficult questions to which private international law must find a response. Another, um, another uh, SDG uh, encourages uh, states and everyone to eliminate forced marriage. Um, it now happens quite often that uh, people from Afghanistan or Syria, for instance, seek refuge in Europe and on the road in order to protect a girl, she marries with a, um, an adult man. Uh, in principle, that is not acceptable. But if that is the only way for her to be protected during the, 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 the journey, as it may well be the case, there may be a ground to recognize that marriage and there are this case law of that sort. So there again you have a private international law problem. It deals with private law because it is a family a family situation and it is international because it has to do with crossing borders. So so much about personal status and family relations. But then um, the several of the SDGs uh, focus on trade and on, on contract law. And on the one hand, they encourage uh, freedom of contract. Uh, for instance, when they call to correct and prevent trade restrictions and distortions in agricultural markets, or when they say promote the development and transfer of environmentally sound technologies to developing countries on favorable terms as mutually agreed. But on the other, in other areas, they insist on restrictions, for example, the eradication right now of forced labor, modern slavery, child trafficking, or an important one, reduce the illicit financial and arms flows or reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. Now in cross-border situations, all this will be a matter for contracts. Um, a, a, a business in country A concludes a contract with a business in country B to buy um, arms. Um, it need not be a government, may, uh, and even uh, then it may be a contractual uh, uh, a case. So here, the SDGs call for a restriction 
of freedom of, of contract, whereas in the first examples, they encourage the freedom of contracts. And then the SDGs um, assume a role for tort law, including in uh, cross-border situations, for example, to fulfill the goals regarding environmental protection and climate change, uh, SDGs 6, 13, 15, and we will come back to that in a moment. But that's not all. Um, several SDGs uh, concern civil litigation across borders. Uh, for instance, when they say you must have equal access to justice for all, traditionally that is understood as there must be within a country, within a state, equal treatment for all within that system. But more and more litigation crosses borders. Uh, for instance, if uh, there was the Volkswagen diesel scandal a few years ago, and I don't know how many Indian citizens were victims of them, of that scandal, but um, if uh, people in the United States had access to US courts to claim high damages, then those Indian victims should have the same right. And there are many other examples, uh, oil pollution, may affect people in other countries and then they should have equal access as those in the country where the pollution originated. And there are many, many, many uh, uh, aspects to cross-border civil procedure, uh, admissibility of global class actions, uh, public interest actions, uh, for instance, in climate uh, change cases. And these uh, problems, uh, and the, the, they, they lead to questions of jurisdiction and enforcement of the resulting judgments, um, often in relation to corporate, social, and environmental uh, responsibility, which is also a very important mounting concept nowadays um, um, that um, is, uh, has private international law aspects to it. And then finally, the Sustainable Development Goals have an institutional component. Uh, SDG 16 calls, among others, for strong institutions and encourages cooperation. Now, the Hague Conference on Private International Law, um, to which I was attached for many, many years, and the conventions, the Hague Conventions, it has produced are of prime importance. Uh, but then there's also the work of UNIDROIT and UNCITRAL and, and some other international organizations uh, they are usually um, small organizations with very, very modest budgets, and uh, but they could do much more if uh, they were more generously uh, funded. Um, um, the problem is uh, that uh, private international law is still mainly regulated at the national scale. So you have the private international law of India, of China, of Japan, of Mexico. In the UK, you have English private international, Scottish private international. In the US, uh, their private international law exists also at the state level. So each of these states has its own system of private international, which, um, and these systems may differ quite considerably. So when one state says uh, jurisdiction belongs uh, there and there, and the other state said, no, 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 it, it belongs elsewhere, then you have a problem. And the same goes for applicable law. Now, in the European Union, important steps have been made to unify private international law, uh, building on the work of the Hague Conference. But uh, that is uh, less so in other parts of the world, uh, more in Latin America than, than elsewhere. But um, in Asia, for instance, uh, there is a lot of work to be done. India um, has been a member of the A conference now for 13 years. It joined in 2008. I was very proud when during my time as Secretary General, uh, we could welcome India as a new member. And in fact, uh, in that year, that same year, we celebrated the uh, 120, I think, uh, 25th birthday of the Hague Conference. And the uh, Minister of um, Migration of, um, of the, of the no, Indians, um, of the Indian diaspora, came to The Hague and gave a wonderful speech at the time. So India is a member, and India has uh, ratified four Hague Conventions the Convention Abolishing Legalization, 
which is practical because it uh, facilitates the circulation of public documents like uh, birth and marriage certificates and uh, wills and so on. Um, there is a convention on the service of documents abroad, legal documents, undertaking of evidence abroad. Um, they are ratified by uh, by the India, and there is the Convention on Intercountry Adoption of Children, of Protection of Children, and Cooperation in Respect of Intercountry Adoption, which India is also a party to. So that is important and that is great, but India is not yet a party to a host of other Hague Conventions, which would be of great um, practical use to citizens and the country uh, itself. Um, there's the Hague Convention on International Child Abduction, uh, and there's the Hague Convention on Child Protection, there is the Convention on the Recovery of Child Support. A uh, child in India, a father moves to, let's say, the United States, refuses to pay support for his child and his wife. You need this convention to get him pay. And it is a very practical convention. It has a lot of power to get recovery of child support. Uh, recognition of divorces. I was told many years ago already that um, authorities in India struggle with that problem or due to the, the diaspora. There are so many millions of Indians abroad, they divorce. And then what do you do with the uh, foreign divorce? Do you recognize it or not? Even the Supreme Court of India has mentioned many years ago already that the Hague Convention would facilitate um, the recognition of, of divorces. Validity of marriage is another important convention. Access to justice. Uh, you, you, you're in India and you want to uh, start proceedings in, let's say, Italy. Uh, you're not so rich, you're not so wealthy. Uh, could, you, could you get um, uh, legal aid on the same footing as Italians if they would address that court? The convention provides for non-discrimination. Protection of adults, uh, vulnerable adults. Uh, they may declare in their good years that they would like to have their son or an, a, a lawyer represent their interests when they are no longer capable of doing so. Will those powers be recognized in other countries? The convention provides the answer. Choice of court. Uh, two businesses agree on uh, designating the courts of New Delhi for their dispute. And then one of the parties says, uh, well, well, uh, after all, I prefer to go to London. No, says the convention. You agreed on the choice of court and you have to, and the court has to accept its jurisdiction. And then finally, the new convention on recognition and enforcement of judgments, very important instrument that will facilitate the uh, effect, giving effect to judgments across borders. Okay, that is, um, yeah, one could almost say a, a little homework for the authorities in New Delhi to consider all these important instruments. Uh, ratifying them costs nothing. Yes, you have to think about implementing legislation, but in some cases that uh, will be relatively easy and they would bring tremendous benefits to a country like India, which is increasingly active on the, on the world scene. Okay, to study the interaction between private international law and the Sustainable Development Goals in more depth, um, Rolf, um, uh, uh, Michaels, uh, Veronica, uh, Ruiz and I organized a conference at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg in September two months ago in, uh, in uh, Hamburg. The Max Planck Institute is a famous institute on comparative and uh, private international law. It was a very successful conference, hybrid, people in the room and people uh, across the planet. Um, and um, the book on the, uh, with the papers of that conference is about to be published. So we had 17 um, authors with who wrote on each of the 17 uh, development goals and we wrote uh, uh, an introduction to the book um, when we invited papers for this conference we thought we might get 10 or 12 uh, papers after all it was a little bit of a crazy idea to uh, invite people to reflect on the sdgs and private international we got 130 papers so that was 
an overwhelming success and made it very difficult for us to, uh, to make a selection. Uh, and in that selection, we considered, um, of course, quality, but also the geographical spread. For instance, in this uh, book, uh, we have four or five people from Africa who wrote uh, chapters. And also, um, we looked at generations. So we included a, a, a quite a few young scholars who have not yet made um, are not yet so well known um, because we wanted the book to be intergenerational. Now, um, the, the relationship, as I say, between private international law and the sustainable development goals um, was not so immediately obvious to everyone. Um, uh, just a typical example, uh, Klaus Beiter from Namibia, B-E-I-T-E-R, um, he wrote on uh, sustainable development goal number four, education. Education, of course, is typically a responsibility of the state. It's a public duty for the state to make sure that everyone enjoys a good education. However, thinking further about it, Klaus realized that nowadays many forms of education are organized privately, like your university, for instance and that this may involve cross-border aspects. So you have um, nowadays choice of jurisdiction, choice of court clauses in contracts between students or teachers and a foreign private educational institution that say that if the students or the teachers are not in agreement, if there's a dispute, then they should go to the home court of the educational institution. Um, and that is uh, not, um, that is a very dubious situation, of course, because if you are, for instance, a, a student in, 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 in India and you've paid thousands of dollars for a course from the United States in the hope that you would learn from that, and that course turns out to be a, a complete disaster, then you, you look at the, the, the small letters and they say, you go to the court in Minnesota to, uh, to, to, to sue. Well, students or teachers cannot ordinarily be expected to bring a claim in the courts of any state other than that of their domicile, in this case, India. And then you have private law actions uh, against foreign institutions. Uh, in the host state, in this example, in, 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 in India, then the minimum educational standards that are enforced publicly in India should at least be the uh, background for that dispute. They should not be ignored. But the contract that you have made with the foreign institution, even though you are before the Indian judge, may say, well, the law of this or that country applies. And that law has much lower standards for education than the Indian standards. So you must have a mechanism, and we call that overriding mandatory rules, which give effect to the minimum standards that apply for education in India, even though the rest of the applicable law would be the law of that other state. Right, so um, let's look, at, let's take a little more close look to a few of the SDGs in their interaction with private international law. And my first case study relates to sustainable development goal number one, poverty. That is, of course, a huge uh, challenge in many developing countries. SDG 1 says, and poverty in all its forms everywhere. It's a big problem in sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of Asia. Poverty should not be a ground alone to take children away from their parents to be adopted abroad. That is not in accordance with the UN Convention on Rights of the Child. Um, so when poverty is the main reason why the judge would decide to um, end parental responsibility and to say, yes, this child may go to parents there and there in a foreign country, that would not be in accordance with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it would not be in accordance with the Hague Intercountry Adoption Convention. 
According to the Hague Convention, which is enforced for India, states should, as a matter of priority, take appropriate measures to enable the child to remain in the care of the family of origin. If that is not uh, possible, then at least the, the uh, family should be tried, to, they should find a family within the, the, the country. And inter-country adoption um, must take place only if it is determined after possibilities for placement of the child within the state of origin have been given due consideration that an inter-country adoption is in the child's best interest. So poverty alone, again, is not a sufficient ground to declare a child adoptable, as has been done often in the past, and have the child uh, adopted across borders. And the, child, and the convention has established, we cannot go in all to, into all the details now, but the convention has established a strong mechanism um, that gives the joint responsibility to both the country of origin of the child and the receiving country to make sure that the norms and the safeguards of the convention are um, respected. There's even a, a provision which is also interesting from a public international law point of view, there is an article 17c in the convention which says that the authorities in the country of origin, let's say in India, may not entrust a child to prospective parents, let's say in, in, in France, unless both states have declared their agreement. So that gives an extraterritorial power, which you can also better say a responsibility to France to stop an adoption, even if it has not yet been completed in India, because Fran France sees that not all the safeguards of the convention have been um, respected. So France cannot say, OK, we have to trust the, uh, in this case, the Indian authorities, and we, uh, we, we, will not, uh, we are not concerned, we have no responsibility. No, France has a, does have a responsibility. And one of the purposes of the convention, of course, is to combat the selling and trafficking of children um, and for that purpose it provides that no child shall be adopted abroad if minimum safeguards and procedures safeguards such as consent of the birth parents um, have not been followed okay that is our first case study where we see interaction between sdg one poverty and the Hague convention in this case on um, uh, on, on intercountry adoption. My second case study concerns uh, SDG 8 on decent work. Uh, the full uh, text of that SDG 8 is promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment. And now I cannot read it what it says, but it doesn't matter. Um, in any event, that is what, what it says. Now, you know that many cross-border workers carry out work temporarily in host countries. And um, that means that they have crossed borders, uh, their own borders, borders of the country where they work. Perhaps they are temporarily posted even in, in a third country. And we know that these workers are particularly vulnerable to lack of protection and abuse. They are prone to discriminatory practices, harsh working conditions, and are lacking labor rights that workers who habitually work in a particular country are entitled to. Social dumping. It's often recognized, but too often unstoppable. In addition, it is difficult for workers who work on foreign soil only temporarily to know how the labor standards that apply to their employment contracts are determined. And resolving questions of applicable law are often complex because different private international law rules apply in different countries and regions, as we have just seen. Now, in the European Union, there are a number of um, legislative instruments that do give protection in those circumstances. Um, the Brussels 1 regulation, Brussels 1 because there's also Brussels 2, the Brussels 1 regulation has special rules on jurisdiction over individual contracts of employees, of employment. 
um, and they go uh, even beyond the borders of member states. If, for instance, a US employer has employed uh, an employee and that US um, um, business has a branch or an agency or another establishment in one of the member states of the European Union, then that employer, although based in the United States, shall be deemed to be domiciled in the European Union. So that gives a grip to the employee over the employer. And Article 21 of that uh, Brussels 1 regulation says that an employer domiciled in a member state may be sued in the course of the member state in which he's domiciled, okay, or in another state in the place in the courts of the place where or from where the employee habitually carries out his work or for the last place where he did so. So that brings the court closer to the employee. Conversely, an employer may bring proceedings only in the courts of the member state in which the employee is domiciled. So these rules give uh, an advantage to the employee who has given more possibilities to sue the employer, uh, but restricts the possibilities for the employer to sue the employee. Um, the protection also extends to the applicable law. The Rome 1 regulation has special rules for individual employment contracts. The parties may choose the applicable law to the contract, but the Article 8.1 says that the choice may not deprive the employee of the protection which he would have had, he or she would have had, um, if there had not been a choice of law. So that gives a certain basic protection to the um, employee because the second paragraph of Article 8.1 says if the law has not been chosen, then the law applies of the country in which or from which the employee habitually carries out his work in performance of the contract. That again brings the, um, the, the law close to the employee. It's not a foreign law, but his or her law that will apply. On top of that, there is uh, the new postings directive, uh, the revised postings directive, which says that even if all this has been correctly applied, whatever the law applicable to the employment relationship, then at least the following minimum things, and there is a whole list of, um, uh, of, of norms, of, of rules, must be applied, such as maximum work periods, minimum rest periods, minimum rates of pay, safety, equality of treatment between men and women, and is missing there. Um, so uh, even if uh, um, uh, the, 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 the even if, if, if a work is temporarily posted in, in another country, um, and uh, then, in, in, then where he habitually carries out his work, then the protective laws of that country must be applied. So this is, I think, a positive uh, development in the European Union. But the question is, what about, the, about decent work protection at the global level? We've heard about the, the scandalous things that have happened, including to Indian workers who went to the Middle East to work there in, in Dubai for the, uh, the football thing. The thousands of workers killed, um, according to The Guardian. That is, should not be possible. We, 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 we think we are um, in an enthusiastic, positive world. We want to see football, high quality football. And uh, in order to do that, we have we tolerate that workers are seduced, have no choice to go to the Middle East to construct beautiful buildings and things and are killed by thousands. Is that is that what, what is, is tolerable in our world? It's it's unbelievable. So I uh, think that it is high time for the world to get its act together in terms of uh, a minimum regime for cross-border work, um, in, uh, as I say, on a global 
uh, scale. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my last uh, case, two case studies, uh, relate to the SDGs that uh, concern uh, clean water, uh, environment, and climate change. Let's start with climate change because that is a very interesting, uh, in interesting example. SDG 13 says, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. We can all say uh, yes to that. Now, what has private international law to do with that? A few years ago, a uh, farmer and, and also a mountain guide in the Peruvian Andes, high mountains, noticed that the glacier behind his village was melting and um, that caused a rise of the lake behind his village and that caused the risk of floods for his village. So what he did was he, you can see that on the, on the, in the picture, he, he constructed, uh, he let pipes so to, to get rid of the, um, of the, uh, the additional, the extra water. But of course that brings costs with it. And he, he was not stupid and he start asking themselves, how, how come that this glacier is, is melting? And then with scientists and a NG, an NGO in, 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 in Germany, he uh, found that uh, this was the result of uh, the warming up of the earth, but that that was caused by CO2 emissions, a half percent of which could be ascribed to the German energy giant RWE. So, he sued, he, he thought, uh, I, well, then I shall make them responsible for the damage. He doesn't claim much, uh, something like 20,000 euros. Uh, that is the percentage for which he claims RWE is uh, responsible. First question of private international law, to which court shall I go, here in Peru or in Germany? Well, he went to, uh, he went to Germany and understandably. Um, and that is understandable because under the Brussels one regulation, which I just mentioned, uh, he, the, the court of the defendant has jurisdiction to deal with a claim against the defendant. The courts in Germany have that uh, jurisdiction. And um, another feature of the Brussels one regulation is that it doesn't provide for forum non convenience. So it doesn't permit the court to say, even though I have jurisdiction, I'm not going to take it because I think you had better go to another court. That is not possible under the Brussels one regulation. So the jurisdiction of the court in Germany is clear and uh, given. Next question, what law applies? Peruvian law, after all, here is the damage, or German law where the um, damage has been caused. And the Rome 1 regulation on applicable law there has a special rule which makes it possible in environmental matters for the victim to choose between the two laws. The victim can say, I want the place of the law of the place of the damage to govern the issue, or I want to place the law of the place where the damage was caused to govern, govern the issue. And you, you may realize that that can make a, a lot of a difference uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the, the way to establish that damage, but also the, the heights of the, uh, the, the, of the damages. Um, many aspects, the, 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 the limitation periods and, and, and so on. Um, so in this case, German law uh, was uh, applicable. Now, the first court in Germany said, well, this is nonsense, of course, we cannot have this. You can never prove that there is a causal relationship between um, RWE's energy uh, production, the CO2 emission that go from Germany all over the planet and mix with the emissions of other states, uh, come on um, out of my court. But the appeal court said, hey, 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 wait a minute. Um, in principle, uh, it may be possible that a company uh, has to bear a certain liability for its part 
in causing climate change. Um, so let's appoint experts to determine the damage and the extent of the liability of RWE. Now, uh, I understand that because of the pandemic, those experts have not yet been able to travel to Peru, which they um, must do, and the results are not yet uh, known, and we don't know uh, where the case uh, stands at, at, at this point. There's no, not yet a decision of the appeal court. My second and last case study concerns SDGs 15 and 6. Uh, SDG 15 talks about the protection and uh, restoring of sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, uh, manage forests, uh, combat desertification, um, etc. And SDG 6 um, ensures the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And there, uh, several cases are uh, going on. Um, there are a few farmers and fishermen in Nigeria who claim that the uh, Shell um, oil production company uh, based in Nigeria, Shell Nigeria, has caused uh, horrible damage to their livelihood, to their lands, their waste, their, their waters. Um, and they have sued uh, not only Shell Nigeria, but also the parent company, because, of course, the parent company, that's where the uh, big pockets are. First question again, jurisdiction. Uh, does the Dutch courts of the seat of the parent have jurisdiction? both in regard to the claims against the parent and the daughter. Um, um, and that is not uh, so obvious because, yes, under the Brussels I Convention, uh, the court has jurisdiction in respect of the mother company, the parent company. But the, more, the Brussels I Convention leaves it to the national laws of the EU member states to determine whether this may be connected with a claim to the daughter. Under Dutch law, that is possible. So yes, the Hague courts accepted jurisdiction, both in respect of the parent and in respect of the daughter, um, even though it might turn out that the parent was not to be uh, held liable. Uh, but, and, and concerning the applicable law, uh, the parties in this case agreed that Nigerian law would apply and that was because it was a bit difficult to establish. The courts said, well, we suppose, as English courts do, that uh, since it has been heavily influenced by English law, that it is, uh, we suppose that it is the same as English law. And the court looked to uh, recent precedents in English court law, the law of um, the Supreme Court, which have accepted the slightly broader liability of. Um, parent companies in respect of the degree of control they need to exercise on what happens in, um, in remote countries. Concretely, there were leaks in the, of the pipelines in, in, in Nigeria, um, oil spread in, in the waters, on the lands, that caused a lot of damage. Um, and the question was, is this a matter of uh, um, sabotage by the locals, local people, or is it a question for which, and, and even if that is so, um, does Shell have a responsibility to make sure that that does not happen? And um, in this case, for certain of these oil uh, spots, drill spots, uh, the court said uh, Shell should have taken more measures to control uh, the, uh, to, to make sure that no accidents and no sabotage could uh, happen. The case is now before the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, so still yet no outcome. But these are very interesting cases that show the interaction with private international law and the sustainable development goals. That brings us to the conclusion. Um, as I said, the sustainable development goals uh, are based on a very original uh, governance strategy, uh, a quantitative strategy with benchmarks to measure progress. Uh, they are not legally binding, uh, they articulate aspirations. So far, so good. 
However, that cannot be it cannot, cannot be all, because the implementation of the SDGs clearly requires also qualitative changes in human behavior. Norm, norms will be necessary, uh, and they remain crucially needed as complementary or implementing strategies to achieve the SDGs. We saw, we realized again, that most transactions, most investments, most destruction of our environment happen not through public, but through private action. And therefore, private law, which governs these actions and transactions, can, cannot be ignored. It, it, it's essential. And when it, there's a cross-border element, then private international law comes in. And there the problem is, of course, that the world remains a kaleidoscope of legal orders and legal systems, uh, constantly in, in movement. Um, private international law makes it possible to connect and mediate between those legal orders and legal systems by providing rules of jurisdiction of the courts on choice of law and on recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, and also facilitating cooperation between the courts of different countries and the administrations of different countries. Those rules intersect with public law, with human rights, migration, competition, data protection, and so forth, which is public law. But that they intersect doesn't mean that they, they are not there. They, uh, it is the combination of the two which is so important. That is uh, why it's critically important to consider private international law in connection with the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a, a complete voyage into the journey of these goals. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm rather proud to share with you Professor Ann Peters of the Max Planck Institute. She spoke for us last semester. She spoke about the fragmentation, fertilization, constitutionalism and deconstitutionalism of international law. In fact, that's how that her reading about her work on fragmentation and fertilization is how I got introduced to her. And then she's now joined us as an international advisor. I'm right. also very, very proud to share with you that our university, and this is something which we as students received an email about today that that the general our university is proud to announce the first launch of the first of its kind report on sustainable development report of 2021 the the university has been jointly authored a report the purpose of mapping the efforts taken by the university in accomplishing accomplishing the sustainable development goals as envisaged by by the united nations and excellent uh, I think this taps really well to the to the African author who speaks about education and empowerment. I think empowerment as a goal, as as Nobel laureate Martya Sen says, that it starts from from the household and it really starts from yeah. the. I have one question, and in the interim, I'd also request others to share their questions in the chat box because this is an opportunity which we as students don't get many times. My question is on eco side. I invested the last few days listening to Professor Christina Watt of the University of Oslo speak about climate change. She is representing Norway in, 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 for COP26. I asked her about the 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 possible achievements of ecocide as a crime against, crime against humanity. Of course, the perpetrators in this will not always be states but also be multinational companies you highlighted shell you highlighted shell in the case of nigeria does ecocide seem like a possible possible or a probable solution wherein there are criminal charges attached to it i juxtapose this to to the indian jurisprudence wherein there is a principle known as the polluters pay principle but i try and reimagine this why should it be that the polluter must pay? Why should the polluter have the ability to pay later on? Why are there not penal consequences attached which should deter it? This is my background thinking of this. An eco side seems like a favorable solution. It also brings criminal charges and embarrassment, which would really hurt the, the fluxes of, of these corporations. <clears throat> Uh, possibly, um, 
but then uh, would the criminal action uh, go against the company itself or to the company directors or even below to those in the fields who have primary responsibility for not uh, being sufficiently sufficiently attentive to the oil spills and the leakages and the sabotage and things like that. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that is uh, the most effective way. Um, I think people uh, and, and, and commercial uh, um, actors in particular are very concerned about their pockets. And when you can hit them in their pockets, uh, that is quite uh, effective. Um, so I, uh, although we are in an early stage, uh, I have already the impression that uh, Shell, which has fought so hard uh, 20 years ago already in the United States to not to be pursued in civil actions, has, has spent millions of uh, dollars and euros uh, on lawyers' costs, that Shell is uh, not at all happy with the judgments that have come from the courts in the Netherlands and also in the UK, by the way, um, and is clearly... Um, uh, drawing lessons from 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 that, um, I, yeah. I, I, of course, I have my background in, in private law. Uh, others come from the criminal side. Both have have a point, um, but in terms of the efficacy, the efficiency of the uh, actions, I stand to be convinced that the the criminal way is um, is the more effective one, particularly since there is this cross-border uh, element to it, uh, because the Nigerians are furious of what happened in Nigeria. But are the Dutch authorities equally furious and ready to punish uh, Shell officials in their country for what they have done in that remote uh, Nigeria? You see? Yeah, yeah, I completely understand the predicament. <clears throat> let's let's take a deeper dive into this predicament because you speak about the patchwork of legal systems and this cross-border system what's the international law perspective from a third world would represent and the efforts of institutions of international institutions and organizations efforts towards towards patching the system together further will seem like new imperial mechanisms at work although the efforts will be quite benign and rightly so what is your understanding on these noble efforts but then there comes a backlash from states because and i think this is true for cop 26 as well this is my personal take on how how international organizations should work and especially conferences and conventions should work i think in these organizations there should be this is what I call domesticated internationalism in the sense that there should be there should be states like the, or there should be organizations like the African Union, the ASEAN, uh, the Latin American states grouped together, clubbed together, representing their voice as opposed to having Netherlands or, or India uh, standalone figures. Would you feel that that would be more representative of the voice and also the echo which comes back towards these international principles not only in the public side but also in the private side because the private side and you touch upon this in the conventions especially with 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 child rights and 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 those extremely extremely nuanced areas which are also very very uh, uh delicate will this method seem possible to you or is or or, or are you trepidatious about this well, leaving aside the qualification of, of decolonization and, and that sort of thing, um, let, let's be, 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 be practical. If a child from, from India is abducted to the United States by one of the parents, illegally, without the consent of the other parent, and without the uh, blessing of the Indian courts, huh? um, then the other, the left behind parent wants that child back. Now, in order to make that possible, you need a system of cooperation between India and the United States. A technical, uh, effective means to get your child back. 
that has nothing to do with politics. It simply means making it possible, making a connection possible, uh, an effective connection that will help people to get what they are entitled to. Now, uh, who should organize that? Um, myself, my predecessor, my successor, uh, we've strived hard uh, to enable the a conference on private international law, although it is based in the Netherlands, a uh, Western country, to be as, as inclusive as, as possible. And that's why I said that I was so proud that India finally joined the A conference and many more states that we are now about, about 90 states. All these states have equal rights and can have an influence on the policies of the organization. Um, there was a time that in Latin America, uh, a lot of activity was going on in this field of private international law. However, recently we have seen that the Latin Latin American states and Latin American lawyers see the Hague Conference as the more efficient forum to get what they need. So uh, that's a very interesting development. Not that we have done anything to jeopardize their efforts. No, welcome to do that. But they have found um, the Hague Conference an adequate forum to deal also with their problems, the more so since we have organized Spanish as a working language and, and, and so on. Um, so I, we have also supported ASEAN, for instance, to try and do things in the field of private international, but it's, 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 it's very slow. Um, uh, no, I, 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 uh, I, I would hope that uh, countries like India, but also in neighboring countries, would uh, increasingly uh, recognize that just looking at the products of the organization, uh, they will find them useful for their own purposes. Yet in the face of this, you have a country like India, which in its re most recent declaration to the ICJ's compulsory jurisdiction rescinds further and further. This is the fourth in a series which spans over a decade. So there remains trepidation on a country like India, especially after the, the, in the immediate aftermath of the Jadav case, this comes out. Dr. Jayashankar, the foreign minister, lists out its, its, its anxiety towards this jurisdiction. There are steps which have been taken by countries in, in rather unfortunate circumstances who also prescribe international jurisdiction, international jurisdiction and dispute resolution mechanisms in its constitution itself. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, th 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 that's a different thing. Uh, yes, because, yes, yes. Because, because, because here we have a text, a convention that has been adopted uh, with the cooperation of India, or perhaps if it's all an older convention, uh, not with its involvement. But in anyway, a text that is only obligatory to India if it has passed the Indian Parliament and the Indian constitutional system. So India remains 100% freedom to accept or not to accept the convention. There's nothing to, to force it. Um, and once the convention is in place, yes, the courts will apply it, but not um, because governmental interests are involved, but because uh, private persons' interests are involved, of the interests of families and of businesses, you see? So I think it's a different, um, a different discussion. Although I, 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 I regret uh, with you that uh, not all of the countries uh, have yet uh, uh, graciously accepted the jurisdiction of the the court nearby. <clears throat> There's one question in the chat box which was sent to me, so I'll I'll yeah. I'll read it out. Uh, that this adds to the question on environment environmentalism and it's specifically the overlap with security laws to hit polluters in the pocket with the OECD taxes on carbon scheduled to increase in 2040 2060 and 2080 when can companies be expected to put these liabilities on their balance sheets how can securities enforcement influence the profitability of the oil economy what are the roles of private investors versus government bringing suits like this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm not co <clears throat> competent to give an answer to the questions about 
the uh, possible effect or not of the OECD measures, although I think the OECD is doing uh, important uh, work, bringing down, so to speak, some of the more abstract norms that the United Nations have endorsed uh, to a more concrete um, level. But one, um, in response to the responsibilities of investors, I would say uh, this, we had a very in-depth discussion, and you will also find it in the book on the private side of transforming our world, in-depth discussions on um, the responsibility of uh, investors. And that touches on the question uh, of uh, jurisdiction of the courts, of respect for local norms, and of the applicable law, because investors tend to invest under their conditions. They want their courts to have jurisdiction where there is a problem. They want their laws to apply, ignoring all too often local rules, including on environmental matters, uh, to apply as well to the uh, situation and the, and the dispute. And um, that may, if many investors do that, and if you have a weak country, a weak host country, that may lead to a race to the bottom. And it uh, may discourage that host country from adopting the environmental laws that, that it needs. So one of the chapters in our book is a call, and we repeat that call in our common introduction, is a call uh, to the world to be more attentive uh, and a call on investors to be more generous in respect of the local laws of the countries where they, where, where they act. Ultimately, that is also in, in their interest. The short-term view is, let's make profit. But if, if the lands go barren, if uh, the waters go, uh, if you get refugees uh, because of climate and so on, that ultimately will, uh, will, will, will hit us all and uh, not to, to, to left alone leaving aside the, the rise of the, the seas and things like that. I think to, to this front, uh, uh, on the environment side, what seems most plausible to me is the nationally determined contributions. I think that's an excellent mechanism to, to, to determine it for yourself and then to share it with everyone as yes. to this is, where, this is where we stand. What are your thoughts about that? I'm very curious because this is, this, I find this cross-cutting and cutting edge. Yeah, of course, you want, you would like to have more. You would like to have a super body uh, somewhere that would instruct uh, the countries to do this and that and the other. But we have learned our lessons. And um, I think the, the whole mechanism is uh, uh, reasonably clever. Uh, it, 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 it works with naming and shaming in a way, huh? because everyone has to come <laughs> to show the results or, or non-results of, of their work, and that will uh, certainly have, have an effect. Um, of course, you need, uh, and, and that is perhaps a weak side to uh, the whole system, you need some sort of inspection that the reports you get that they are truthful, that they are, and that is why um, it is important that the system remains open to NGOs who criticize governments. And fortunately, India is a democracy where NGOs will do that. But in some other countries, that is not the case. So there you have a real problem. Is country X, which has a, um, a dictatorial regime, uh, shows beautiful uh, figures about uh, its results. And there is no way uh, within that country to check whether that is true, then we have, we have a, a, a problem. Um, but uh, the other side of it is that uh, we are now really experiencing, uh, almost all of us, the effects of uh, climate change. Um, here in Holland, we have had sudden um, uh, floods and, and rains, uh, storms uh, that we haven't had, uh, or only occasionally in, 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 in the past years, uh, serious uh, reports now on, on the rising of the seawater. Our dikes are not sufficiently high and so on. Other countries have even far more serious problems. Um, and uh, the United States, which for some time at least, where several people, many people thought, okay, that, that's not us, they also experienced that. So everyone now is beginning to realize that something must, must be done. And that makes all of us sharp also in, in this respect. So although, yes, I would have liked to have a, a stricter system, and it may come 
up in years to come. For the moment, I agree with you. This is a good system. Well, let, let's shift grounds a little to uh, health and well-being, and we'll close after this. Uh, there's, there's, questions, there's another question which has been sent in the personal chat, so I'll, I'll read it out. How do you think that the sustainable development goal, goal of good health and well-being can address the issue of euthanasia? Which oh, I no, euthanasia. Oh. euthanasia uh, which I understand is a big part of public discourse in countries like Netherlands and Switzerland. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is, it, it is uh, more an ethical question, uh, I think, than, than anything else, uh, and a moral question. And yes, there are discussions about uh, that in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Switzerland, although in the, in the press and the media, uh, this is sometimes blown up to an extent that is uh, hardly uh, a reflection of the reality in, in our countries. Yes. Uh, local laws are somehow uh, experimenting with um, defining circumstances in which uh, euthanasia may be considered under strict safeguards. And then some people look for the, uh, the, the, the borders and transgress the borders and then are being prosecuted and uh, courts, uh, and there have been court cases as well. Um, I uh, think that is a question that will sooner or later also reach other uh, countries. People are now getting older. Uh, they are, uh, and, and they have, they are getting uh, diseases and um, very uh, nasty diseases. And the, the, the pressure for good rules on euthanasia uh, will probably uh, grow in other countries. Um, but I am personally not, uh, I don't think that should be the focus of SDG for, for, for what is it on, uh, no, for is education, uh, to on, um, on health. And um, no, what we need to do is to make sure that, um, um, that, that we, we uh, attack things like uh, malaria, polio, and that sort of diseases that should have disappeared from our planet uh, decades ago, but are still making victims among, uh, among children and, and, and so on. That, that should be the focus. Now, in that respect, some good news is that uh, there are now also um, uh, ICT platforms that make it possible to remotely um, uh, treat uh, patients um, and the question there is, uh, what law applies to the uh, arrangements that make that possible? Very interesting uh, discussions. What law applies to reinsurance for that? Um, those are qu questions that you will find discussed in um, the uh, chapter in the book on, uh, on, on, on global health. Um, th those big issues uh, concerning uh, not so much the elderly, although they also should be uh, concerned, but uh, the youngsters and the normal population, which should be free of basic um, diseases. That is, in my view, the, the focus of, uh, of this uh, sustainable development goals, particularly in developing countries. Especially in a young country like India. Absolutely in agreement. With that note of agreement, I thank Professor Hans Van Loon who's taken out time on a Friday evening for us, Friday afternoon for him. Uh, yeah. So we're so grateful to him for sharing his thoughts, his expert vision and years of experience with us. We're so grateful to him for that. I'm also thankful to our participants who've joined us. Thank you so much, Professor. We're delighted and honored to host you. We extend the invitation to you to host you on campus next time around hopefully next year when things have improved in our country and in yours. Thank you so much, Professor. Final words and then we can close. Thank you very, very much for your, your kind invitation. Thank you all for your uh, attention. Uh, and I would say uh, as the um, SDGs uh, are addressed to, to all of us and each of us, um, if you hadn't um, been familiar with them, uh, 
try to own them and try to, to see and do what you can do in your neighborhood to, uh, to make them uh, a, a, a reality. If you, if you dive into it, them, you will see that they are full of contradictions and they are not ideal and so on and so forth, but they are the only uh, roadmap that we have agreed by our leaders and we should hold our leaders accountable and also do our part to uh, make them a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sir. I joined the students in the chat box who are thanking you. I thank you on their behalf, on my own behalf as well, and also on behalf of the center, the society, and the university writ large. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.